Alright, and for the gearing of this character, we have a mix of rare items and certain unique items. And we're going to go over each item and explain why I have it and why that is good for the character. So let's start off with the wand. On the wand, I have just a rare wand with certain modifiers that is very good for the build. And the modifiers that you want on your wand are spell damage, lightning damage to spells, cast speed, critical strike chance for spells, and global critical strike multiplier. Other good modifiers that you can try to get as well if possible is plus one to level of all spell skill gems, plus one to level of all physical spell skill gems, and plus one to level of all lightning spell skill gems. This is because spell skill gems is very good damage for many spellcaster builds, and these different modifiers can increase the levels of the gems that we use in this build. So this wand isn't really anything particularly crazy, but it works for me and I haven't really bothered uh, changing it so far. And then for the first ring, we have the Essence Worm Unset Ring. And the reason we have this is because we want to use Wrath as a gem because it boosts our damage. But what the Essence Worm Ring does is that it removes all reservation from the socketed gem that you have. So we have Wrath enabled, but it's not taking any of our mana as a reservation because we are playing the mind over matter stuff. So we really want to have all our mana available to us for our arcane cloak and uh, just as a defensive buff because we're playing all the mind over matter playstyle that we are. And then our second ring, it's just a ring with life and resist, and it is a magic ring. And the reason we have a magic ring with just life and resists is because of the Viridis Veil Praetor Crown. So what this helmet does is that it gives us socketed level, uh, level of socketed gems, it gives us some armor energy shield, nothing really particularly crazy, some elemental resistances, which is nice, but the main thing about this helmet is that it gives damage of enemies hitting you is unlucky while you have a magic ring equipped. So this is very good defensively for us because of how this mechanic work. And then the main thing about this helmet is the second line in this here where it says you are hexproof if you have a magic ring in the right slot. So the last one there, take no extra damage from critical strikes if you have a magic ring in the left slot. That's not the one we focus on as we do have the essence worm ring here. The main things are the magic ring equipped overall and having it in the right slot. 
And the reason we want this is because of the hex proof. So when we have the soul mantle spider silk robe, inflicts a random hex on you when your totems die with 80% more effect. So if I spam totems like this, every time you keep resummoning a totem, one of your old totems will die or disappear, which will trigger a hex. All these hexes are really bad for us. We have lesser resistances and we do deal less damage and all these kind of things. Like this is not good for us. This is not something we want. Temple chains, you know, we're walking slower and we have lower car speed and all that stuff. That's not good for us. But if we have this helmet paired with a magic ring in our right slot, we are hexproof. So as you can see above my character, there are like these little locks above my head. And that means that these are curses that are applied to us or hexes. But with the lock, it shows that they aren't actually doing anything. So what this means is that hexes are being applied to us and we are cursed. But they don't actually do anything. So the Enfeeble one, for example, you are cursed, you deal less damage and have reduced accuracy. It's, it's applied to us, but it actually doesn't do anything. We, we don't deal less damage because we are hexproof. And this is incredibly strong because of the other items that we have paired this character with. So we have the Soul Mantle Spider Silk Rope to gain a lot of hexes on us when our totems die. And the reason we want this uh, armor is because it is a pseudo 7 link armor. And what that means is that the armor itself has socketed gems are supported with level 20 spell totem. So this means that instead of having to use spell totem ourselves in our 6 link, we can instead skip that and have another 6 link alongside with this one to make a pseudo 7 link. So we can increase our damage a lot more with our totems. And the other very interesting item that I have chosen for the end game of this character is the Coward's Legacy Chain Belt. And the reason for this is because you count as low life while you are cursed with vulnerability. And you are cursed with vulnerability with 80% increased effect. So once again, we always have vulnerability on us, but since we are hexproof, vulnerability doesn't actually do anything and we don't have to be scared about how really bad vulnerability is to have on your character defensively, but it doesn't matter because it doesn't do anything for us. But what this does instead is that it counts us as low life. And why is this so good? Well, because of pain attunement, 30% more spell damage when on low life. So that gives us a massive damage boost. And then I've also opted in to go for the Duress's Court Baroque Round Shield here, because this is just so incredibly strong defensively. It gives a bunch of spell and attack block when you're on low life and in general as well. Decent resists. And this just absolutely max out our block altogether. And it is such a cheap, easy and well, uh, well uh, really good shield for us to have if you are playing low life, which we are, in order to max out our block. So it's really good defensively and it's really cheap. And that's why I've been opting to use that for this build with the low life stuff here, with the hex proof. Like it all just ties in together and makes the uh, build work really well. Then for the amulet, we have nothing really particularly crazy. Life crit multi resistances even have a little bit of man and, uh, and life region there i crafted on because i had an open uh, prefix and uh, you know mana is very good for this character as well since we're playing the mind over matter kind of stuff uh, for the gloves we have life resistances once again a little bit of mana and the main thing that you want to have on your gloves for late game is the physical damage converted to lightning damage so we want to convert all our physical damage over to lightning damage and we're going to go into that a little bit more later on for the boots i have opted in life movement speed a little bit of mana and resistances once again it is very important that on boots that you actually go for high movement speed because movement speed is a great quality of life to have in Path of Exile and you definitely want as high movement speed as possible. For flasks, I have a life flask with remove bleed and instant because that's very nice. Ball faith is for damage on bosses and, and juicy maps if you want it. Otherwise, I play with a 
quartz flask that gives me facing and gives me dodge because facing is a very big quality of life being able to pass through enemies especially when you're running around just putting up totems as you're running through enemies this can also be very good so sometimes i swap out the bull faith for this quartz flask uh, then we have the at series promise nothing really special just gives us a bunch of damage gives a little bit of chaos res i have a diamond flask with car speed and maximum charges nothing really crazy you just want a diamond flask and then i have a quicksilver flask of the heat because we are not ailment immune and you really need a freeze uh, immunity somewhere because freeze immunity is really big in mapping and i always go for that on my quicksilver flask whenever i play characters that are not ailment immune now for the jewels that we have in the skill tree i have gotten myself a watcher's eye prismatic jewel with damage penetrates lightning resistances while affected by wrath because this gives us a lot of damage and we do have wrath as i said in the ring slot here so this is a big juicy damage for us to use then rings uh, uh sorry then another jewel that i have is the self flagellation viridian jewel and this once again ties in so well with this build because of increased damage per curse on you and as you know we have a lot of curses on our character so more curses more spamming and we will be cursed quite a bit equals more damage for us at this expense of nothing because curses actually don't affect us in any way so the self-flagellation is a very important and really good jewel to have which costs absolutely nothing as well then for late game i have a thread of hope with a medium ring and the reason why you want this is because you want to be able to get singular focus arcane capacitor divine wrath and divine judgment so what the thread of hope jewel does is that it gives you a ring based on what thread of hope it is you have small medium large and very large and depending on the size of the ring there is this ring as you can see here that is around this jewel and the medium ring makes it so it is this size here and what this means is that all the nodes within this ring can be applied without having to uh, path through there. So as you can see here, I have singular focus, but I have not gone all the way up in the skill tree to get singular focus. I can just get singular focus on itself without having to spend a bunch of skill points going there. And the same thing goes for arcane capacitor. The same thing goes for divine wrath and divine judgment. So other things that I could get, you know, is like Smashing Strikes, Divine Fury, I could get Righteous Army, but we don't want any of those things. The main things that we want is, are these four right here. And then the last jewel that I have is just some life damage taken, recoup this mana, facing for four seconds on kill, which doesn't really work, but it's just there. Uh, and then just some fire damage spells. I just picked this up really cheap because I just wanted to fill one of my jewel sockets and I haven't really bothered with it. And another one I have is a clear mind cobble jewel because mana regeneration rate is really good for a character with mind over matter stuff and increase spell damage while no mana is reserved. And we do not reserve any mana because the only thing that we have is wrath inside the essence worm so that doesn't reserve any mana and we don't have any other auras so we're not reserving mana and therefore the clear mind cobalt jewel is really good for us and also one little thing that i almost forgot is that we use a medium cluster jewel in this build and the one that we want is the increased totem damage base and the main node that we want to try to craft on this or buy if you're buying it is the sleepless sentries so the sleepless sentries gives you onslaught if you have summoned a totem recently which is very good quality of life because of movement speed but it also gives us a lot of cast speed which will increase our dps output quite a bit so sleepless sentries is the main one that you want if you can afford it or if you're lucky with crafting and pair with something else that's a great but this is the main thing that we want at least on this character as you can see here onslaught buff whenever i am spamming totems we will now quickly go over the skill tree and a little bit about why I've chosen some things in the skill tree. But know this, that there is a forum build guide for the entire character where you can level from 1 to 95. There are multiple sections for leveling and skill trees and leveling gems and all such things if you are interested in that. But right now I'm going to show you the end game skill tree that I've set up for my character.
So let's start off with the Sanctuary. We go this because we want as much block as possible. We then go Glancing Blows to get max block. But Glancing Blows, you know, is a form of mitigation because we actually take damage from blocked hits. But it doubles our block and uh, attack and spell block. So we can actually hit max block. So we still do that. Then we have an unwavering stance because uh, we cannot be stunned with the unwavering stance and that's really important. We don't really care about evade since we aren't an evasion build. We have the agnostic which puts our energy shield at zero but what it does instead is that while not on full life sacrifice 20% of mana per second to recover that much life. So whenever we're not at full life like let's say we get hit for damage and we lose half our HP it will then use the mana as a HP re regenerator and it will regenerate HP super fast based on our mana and our mana pool. So this is really good defensively if you actually do take some damage and we have quite good mana regeneration and a decent mana pool on this character. So if we take damage it will just use up the mana to regain full HP as soon as possible. So uh, you know we don't die because if we take a large hit and if we take another large hit we're probably going to die. But if we take a large hit we regain all the HP super fast and maybe we can survive the second one again. Um, this puts your energy shield at zero, so I do not suggest getting any energy shield gear, which I actually failed because I have sorcerer's gloves and, and like these energy shield boots. And uh, that's something I realized later on that I actually wanted to try the agnostic and I actually did enjoy it. So I suggest going for more armor base gear if you can and, uh, and you know, stack defenses through that instead of getting a lot of energy shield, which I did, which then became useless for me. Um, then, you know, the Thread of Hope, we get Divine Wrath and all that stuff, but the main thing here is that we want Divine Wrath. Divine Wrath, paired with the gloves that we have, gives us 25% physical damage converted to lightning damage, and once again the gloves, 25% physical damage converted to lightning damage. Then the Divine Ire itself converts 50% of physical damage converted to lightning damage. Since we are an elemental build and we focus on lightning damage, we therefore want to convert all the physical damage of the Divine Iron Gem over to lightning. Since we use Wrath and we have lightning penetration and all those things, we definitely want to focus heavily on converting all that over to lightning so we can deal as much damage as possible through that, through that as well. And then we have Ancestral Bond because this gives us a more maximum number of totems. But what this means is that we cannot deal damage with skills ourselves. So if you do any form of damage with any gem, uh, no, it doesn't work. You need to do it through totems. And uh, the reason we go this just though is because it's very strong. More totems, more damage for us. And then, you know, the skill tree is, is very general. It's, you know, we have Mind Over Matter because we're playing the Mind Over Matter stuff and if you want more details on how mind over matter works and why it's good defensively and how it works for this build i suggest go reading the information section on the build forum guide and then you know we have shaman's dominion because of all the crit and all the damage mental rapidity car speed and and mana regeneration and we have mana stuff like arcane will we have deep thoughts uh, mystic bulwark and portal perfection for mana block and damage and uh, yeah, just a bunch of crit stuff and, and you know, some life notes here and there. It's nothing really too special. And for the Hierophant Ascendancy, I have chosen Divine Guidance because of how it works with mana. Damage, taken is, uh, damage is taken from mana before life. This kind of works as Mind Over Matter 2.0, just not as strong. And Transfiguration uh, of Mind gives us damage uh, at 30% of the value of uh, mana as well. And Pursuit of Faith, more totems, totem placement speed and totem duration. And placement speed is how fast you can spam totems. As you can see here, I can spam totems really fast. And then we have Ritual of Awakening, more damage per totem, mana regeneration per totem and life regeneration per uh, totem as well. And then Conviction of Power is actually really nice to have because it gives us plus one maximum power charges and uh, maximum endurance charges. And it gives us those endurance charges and power charges at all times. So as you can see here, we always have endurance and power charges. This is good defensively and this is good offensively as well because we are a crit build. For the Pantheon, I have chosen Soul of Lunaris and Soul of Shakari. These are kind of whatever you want to go with. I usually go Soul of Lunaris because I'm just a fan of it. More movement speed and physical damage reduction based on enemies around me. 
and uh, solo shikari reduce chaos damage taken we're not really that heavy on you know chaos rest so that's always good to have and uh, yeah that is basically it so for the skill gems of this character we have the flame dash will be our movement skill and i have linked that with faster casting and second wind support so we get another charge and we cast it generally just really fast because that is very good quality of life for movement skills then for a helmet we have sigil power increased duration second wind and summon lightning golem now the golem is just there to give us some nice more cast speed and 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 stuff like that but the main thing that we want to use here is sigil of power so Sigil of Power is a ground effect buff that we stand inside, we gain more damage and we also gain some defensive buffs from this as well. Uh, gain a stage when you spend a total of 461 mana while in the area. 10% increase mana cost of skills while in the area. Enemies in area deal 20% less damage while at maximum stages. Maximum 4 stages and also buff grants ad added lightning damage per stage. So what this means is that we put it down, we use spells, we spend mana in here, the sigil will gain more stages and we will gain more damage and enemies will also deal less damage inside this. So we just put this down for, you know, ultimatums or any form of hard, hard content or bosses and stuff like that, we stand inside it. So it's nice uh, defensively and really good offensively as well. Then we have uh, Wave of Conviction, Trap Support and Increased Duration. So Wave of Conviction is a spell that when you hit an enemy, it will expose the enemy for lowered light, uh, elemental resistances based on what damage you deal with the Wave of Conviction. So since we deal so much lightning damage, Wave of Conviction will trigger the lightning exposure and we will deal more lightning damage to the enemy. And the reason why we have this on a trap is because we have Ancestral Bond. And therefore we cannot deal damage, uh, uh, we, we can actually not deal damage ourselves. So we have to use a trap to deal the damage through the trap instead since we can't because of Ancestral Bond. So what you do is that you just uh, throw the trap on the boss, it will trigger Wave Conviction and the boss will take more lightning damage. Then we have Arcane Cloak, Arcane Surge and Increased Duration Support. And Arcane Cloak I have put on my left click when I'm walking around because I think it's really chill to have that. And Arcane Cloak is a damage buff that gives us a damage boost based on the amount of mana that we spend for this. So you can see here I click on it, it uses up a lot of my mana and then it will give me uh arcane search as well because we have level 20 arcane search linked with arcane cloak so arcane search is another damage buff that we use in pair with this to trigger them both at the same time as you can see here grants added lightning damage and a percentage of damage from hits will be taken from this buff before your life or energy shield and then arcane search also gives us spell damage cost speed and mana regeneration so the way that arcane cloaks works is that it gives us damage and then it also works as a shield for us kinda so it will take damage from this buff here before it takes damage from us ourselves so it's just another defensive layer to have which is really good while also at the same time giving us a bunch of damage while we're just running around and since we have uh since we have dynamo here you see that we get increased mana Guard skills have increased duration, this counts as a guard skill, and recover 20% of mana over one second when you use a guard skill. So when we trigger this, we lose a lot of mana, which could be bad since we want mana for a mind over matter and stuff like that. But our mana rege regeneration is so fast because of dynamo that our mana instantly goes back up after using this. So it's good defensively and it's really good offensively as well. And then last here we have Arcanist Brand, Calling Strike, Assassin's Mark and Blade Blast. And the way that Arcanist Brand works is that a brand is something that you could put down like this. It looks like a little circle here and brands will attach to an enemy. So if, if there's like an enemy here, I put down the brand here. This will like attach and stick to that enemy for the duration of the brand. And what Arcanist Brand does is that it 
uses up the gems linked to the Arcanist brand. Since I have Assassin's Mark here, the Arcanist brand will then cast Assassin's Mark on the enemy. And since I have Blade Blast here, it will then also cast Blade Blast. So it will, it will cast Assassin's Mark and Blade Blast and Assassin's Mark and Blade Blast. And the reason why I have chosen these three things here is because Assassin's Mark gives us a lot of damage. More crit chance, more crit multiplier against the enemy that is cursed by Assassin's Mark. And we're a crit based build so we really want this and it's super strong for bosses for example. And then I also have Blade Blast, low level, doesn't really matter. What Blade Blast does is that when Blade Blast hits an enemy, it unnerves the enemy so it increases the spell damage it takes as well. So Blade Blast doesn't need to be leveled up, we just use it to trigger unnerve on the enemy for 4 seconds so we deal more spell damage. And then the last thing that we have here is Cooling Strike Support. And what Cooling Strike does is that whenever you hit an enemy with Cooling Strike Support, if the enemy is at 10% or lower HP, it will instantly get one shot. So if you're dealing with a very high HP enemy, a very strong boss or something like that, that you're having to struggle killing, whenever you get him to 10% HP, just know that I have won. Because as soon as you put down the Arcanist brand, as soon as it uses Blade Blast, which is linked to Calling Strike, you will instantly kill this enemy. Cause he's at 10% life or lower. Bam, just one shot and easy game. And then of course we have the six link divine ire we have divine ire that's our main skill we have infused channeling support and just so you know totems cannot gain infusion and we do not gain infusion through the totems either the reason we're using this is purely for damage i then have elemental focus and the reason why i have this is because shocking can be a little bit wonky when you're playing divine ire so I rather go with elemental focus just to have a steadier, uh, steadier amount of DPS instead of it being a little bit up and down uh, because we're trying to shock and all that stuff. I rather just have elemental focus. It's good, steady, high damage instead. Concentrate effect is because of the damage output that it has as more area damage and increased area damage and you know divine area counts as a uh, as an area spell so this is really good for us now the less area effect might sound scary but we're going to go into that later and explain why it doesn't really matter for this and then we have lightning penetration support since we deal so much lightning damage we want to penetrate lightning resistances of our enemies and also just deal more lightning damage and then we have multiple totem support as well because of uh, uh, how multiple totems work you summon two totems instead of one totem and since we have six maximum totems it can be a little bit annoying otherwise having to spam your button so hard to like spawn all your totems but this spawns two instead of one at the same time so we can easily get up to six and it also gives plus two to maximum number of summon totems and we're totem build we want to have as many totems as possible because that is just more damage you know we have a special bond and all that stuff and we have the armor itself and then multiple totems we can have six totems we just spam it like this big big damage and uh yeah that's why we go with multiple totems as well all right and let's go over some mechanics and some information about the build itself and kind of how it works now one thing i want to tell you is that there is an extensive guide on the forum for this character and in the information section you can find more information about mechanics about the build and therefore i will not explain some of those mechanics in this build in this video right here like how mind over matter works and all the block and all that stuff i will instead go over some things that was mentioned in this video and some other mechanics that are easily shown in the video so for example, when we talked about the area of effect of Divine Ire and the reason why I use Concentrated Effect is because of this. So when you channel Divine Ire, you have this circle around your character. And enemies within this circle will get hit with your channeling. So Divine Ire is a channeling skill where you channel up to 20 charges as you can see here and then you release a beam. So I channel, it goes from 1 to 20, and then I release a beam. So the channeling here, it deals a decent amount of damage, but nothing really too major. It is the beam that is the main damage source. So there are some interesting uh, ways that Divine Iron works here. When you hit enemies inside the beam, 
your charges will channel to 20 much faster. You can see now it goes from, from 1 to 20, but as the gem says here, gains an additional stage when hitting a rare or unique enemy, and a 40% chance to gain additional stage when hitting a normal or magic enemy. So when you hit enemies, you gain stages faster, and when you hit unique enemies like bosses, you will gain stages much, much faster. So as you can see here, 1 to 20, and then I release. But if we were to hit any monsters right now, it would go in even faster. And the speed it goes from 1 to 20 is based on your call speed. So therefore, call speed is really good to have on your Divine Ire, because then you can go from 1 to 20 faster. So you can just release like crazy, just hold on, release, hold on, release like this. But you want to obviously hit 20 stages. So the way that Divine Ire works is that it releases a beam, as you can see here. And the beam itself is actually not based on area of effect. So if I put in concentrate effect here, the beam will still be the same size. The only thing that changes is the channeling area around us. So as you can see here, the channel area goes to like up here right now, kind of like this pole right or this thing here. It goes like this line here, goes around here. But if I put concentrate effect, it only goes like, instead of going there, it's like over here somewhere. So it's a little bit smaller, you know, and therefore you might not hit enemies as easy with the channeling around you to gain 20 stages based on concentrate effect. And if I had increased arrow effect instead, it will go much longer. It's almost like up here now. So it's a lot larger. The circle is larger. I can hit more enemies, gain 20 stages faster. But it doesn't really matter uh, to use constant chain effect then if we're using totems because with totems we just put down a bunch of totems like this and the totems themselves will generate or, or like channel divine ire around them. So if I just go up to a couple of enemies and I just you know put down totems around them, the totems will just channel this divine ire thing and the totems will hit them. And in my opinion, having larger AOE for this, for the totems, doesn't really matter. But the damage that we gain instead from Concentrate Effect is really massive. So Concentrate Effect is absolutely not an issue here. Don't really have to worry about that. Uh, that's why I play it. And as you can see here, 1 to 20 stages goes that fast. But if we actually hit some enemies, it goes a lot faster. And if we would hit like a rare enemy, let's see if we have a rare enemy somewhere around here. If we hit a rare enemy, it goes to 20 really fast. As you can see here, 20, 20, 20, 20. It goes really, really fast. So when we then link this with the totems, once again, we just put down totems around the enemy like this and all the totems will channel really fast against the enemy and it will just spam out these divine arrow beams max uh, 20, ch uh, 20 stages divine arrow beams really fast and really easy and the way that it works then is that when you're mapping you just kind of walk along like you kind of just walk put down totems around the enemies and you just keep on walking like this i just put down totems i keep on walking i put down totems and i walk this is what i do all the time i just put down totems around enemies if there's a pack of enemies, I put totems inside the pack. The Divine Ire will channel to 20, probably kill them during the channel. And then otherwise it will release when the beam is at 20 and it will kill them all off. Thank you very much for watching the video and I'm sorry that it was a very long video. Now, more information about the build can be found on the build guide on the forum. All the information about the mechanics of the build, the gear, the leveling sections, the skill trees, path of building and everything that you need to know can be found in the build guide that will be linked in the description.